But patients that have problems swallowing, patients that have have been having problems uh, with weight or uh, gain or losing weight um, without really dieting or anything like that, Mm -hmm. patients that have a history of uh, esophageal or stomach cancer in their family, are also patients that have some patients that have vomited uh, blood or have uh, uh, defecated some dark stool that may be or may not may not be blood. Those are the, the alarm. We look for all these things in patients to make sure that we have a good reason to pursue further testing. And the the the, the number one instrument that we have at our hands is the the upper endoscopy. So the uh, so it's basically a camera that allows us to go into the stomach and basically inspect and exclude other things that may be also present. And that's basically the first step um, to to take when somebody has alarm symptoms. One of the symptoms is basically reflux that does not get better despite proper therapy. Mm. Sometimes we have to have a we have to have a look. Well, I really like Pepsi Complete. That's my um, my heartburn over the counter, but that's mm. something that my primary care could could handle. So if I came into you and nothing made it better, my I spoke to my primary care. What test would be the first thing? Would it be that upper endoscopy? Would it be that yeah. um, looking at the top down, right? Yeah. And so basically the upper endoscopy is a very good test. It's a, it allows us to look uh, the, the entire length of the stomach, uh, um, of the esophagus, the stomach, and also a little bit of the small bowel. And we really uh, spend some time there looking around, make sure that we see for signs of damage, inflammation, irritation that could explain the symptoms and it can also guide the therapy. It can tell you mm-hmm. how long, it can tell us how long we can treat, this, uh, we should treat this person for. And uh, it also, but the main thing and it does, it excludes bad things. Mm-hmm. So when you have a lot of reflux, your esophagus could get tight and strictured and that's that precludes uh, proper swallowing. Sometimes you have uh, what we call a hiatal hernia, which mm-hmm. can cause reflux, and the, and we can diagnose a hiatal hernia. And sometimes you have other bad things that um, we can actually exclude by doing this test. The endoscopy not only includes looking, but we can also take little samples or biopsies and examine it under the microscope and determine whether this is something that we should worry about or not. Wow. Now, at your hospital at Mount Sinai, what are you doing there? I know there was some exciting therapies um, that you had on your site. What are some of the things that they could expect? So upper endoscopy, fine. Um, Maybe a lower, maybe looking at the lower GI tract would be anticipated. But you have something called strata therapy. What, What is that? Is that like on everybody's timeline or is that something that's for very specific cases? It's it's for very specific cases. Well, basically, strata therapy has been around for approximately ten years, and it's performed by placing, by basically doing an endoscopy, placing a tube down the throat, and then delivering non-ablative radio frequency energy or waves to the muscle between the stomach and the esophagus, that valve or sphincter that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So we deliver energy to that valve or sphincter, which causes thickening of that muscle that's basically a little bit weak, and uh, over time, this creates a stronger, thicker, more functional valve between the stomach and the esophagus, resulting in fewer reflux issues. This, is, this does not involve any surgery, there's no incisions or, scar, or scars, and it's an ambulatory uh, procedure. So that's, that's stratotherapy. It's one of the options that people have uh, that's, not surgic, that's not surgical, um, and it's an option to avoid taking medications for a long time in their life. Some people don't want to do that. There's multiple reasons for that. Um, and, uh, of course, at Sinai, it's a, Sinai is a big place. Yeah. Um, the, so there are um, thoracic surgeons that offer uh, treatment, surgical treatment for reflux. Sometimes, some cases, we have to proceed to that because um, um, the medications just would not uh, do it. But definitely, um, um, we have a, vari- a variety of, of, of therapies to control. Reflux is something that can be controlled. We have options, and Shredder just happens to be one of the one of the one of the more novel, and uh, it's very it's very effective, and it's actually very um, easy to do.
It actually looks very, it seems very non-intrusive. So if, yeah. I, if someone would recommend that to me opposed to, I mean, I know so many people that live with this, just live with it. And they they walk around and they're telling you that they've got, you know, heartburn or reflux and everybody's too busy. Is there anything that um, in your lifestyle that you could change that would kind of help, you know, either with the strat, like if you do the strata therapy, it will work, but do you have to change certain things in your lifestyle? That's where I'm getting at. Like, do, well, you, do people really need to look at how they're living, how they're eating? No matter what you do, is is that a, a really important part of, of GERD management? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. One of the fundamental uh, components of treating reflux and GERD, it's basically lifestyle modifications. Sometimes if we don't do this, nothing will work. Mm. There's a few things that we've that have actual data that demonstrate that, that it actually helps if people do it. So uh, the limitation of alcohol consumption, uh, it's important because alcohol weakens that sphincter that we mentioned that doesn't work well in people that have GERD. Um, uh, limitation of uh, soda or things that are carbonated that can cause pressure in the stomach uh, uh, just by having all this gas there. Uh, uh, avoidance of uh, tobacco, for, for sure. Eating slowly, slower, uh, smaller meals and allowing about three to four hours between dinner and going to bed. Mm. That's important. That's huge. Um, yeah, it's very important. Um, there's, There's really good data that correlates obesity and reflux. So losing weight itself can be a cure for, for your symptoms of heartburn if you, you can actually get to do it. You know, this is not as easily done as it's easily said, right? Uh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and then there's some, there's the, 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 the avoidance of spices and seasonings that's something that people describe because we don't have a lot of data on that yeah but yeah but we sometimes people say that they feel better if they have a blander diet but definitely um the ones that i mentioned before are are, are things you want to do along with any type of therapy pharmacological therapy endoscopy therapy or even surgery you have to be able to to combine these with lifestyle modifications I just got a quick question on a piece of paper. It says, um, can coffee cre- create GERD? So what is what is your stand with coffee? We're a lot of coffee drinkers, and so, I know a lot of coffee drinkers. Is that any relationship? Because people will say, oh, you drink too much coffee. They'll blame coffee for everything. It's either cigarette I, smoking or coffee, you know? So how is coffee? I love coffee, too, I, I got to tell you. And that's probably, that's why I'm, that's when the, the, the phenomenon of bias comes in, because I didn't mention it, because I really love <laughs> coffee. But at the end of the day, uh, there's things that we know have been proven to decrease the pressure of the lower of the lower esophageal sphincter. So, when 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 that sphincter that valve stops working well, that's yeah. when you get the reflux, right? And we know things. There are things that have that have been proven to do that. One of them is caffeine. Oh boy, coffee does it. Uh, uh, cigarettes do it. Uh, so sweets, alcohol, and uh, some. Spices mainly mint, but at the end of the day, um, um, those things are all part of the lifestyle modification. So definitely, coffee is 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 one of the culprits, unfortunately. Although it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's okay. He he got his answer, so he's okay. <laughs> but um, so now, what is the youngest person? I'm going to ask this is silly, but I like to always know what is the youngest person you've treated for GERD. Because I know someone fairly young that was affected by GERD and, and nutrition and that kind of lifestyle modifications was done and it was a huge help. And, and it was a younger person. What's the youngest person you've ever treated for GERD? And what's the oldest person that you've ever treated for GERD? So it's, we can all approach you if we need it. What is the... Absolutely. I mean, I defer to my pediatric gastroenterology okay. colleagues uh-huh. for, the, uh, for the the youngest people I treat are probably eighteen, seventeen, not more than that. But I know in my particular case, I remember having reflux since I was nine years old. Mm-hmm. So it's I've had it all my life, and uh, it's really it really got bad when I was like around college. But you you can have it at any age. It's more common, obviously, in adults. Uh, um, it's and the the, the one that newborns and infants have it's a different type of phenomenon yeah uh, but uh, this more physiological uh, type of thing but the 
um, you can have reflux at a very young age, and your pediat your pediatrician could diagnose, and and a ped- and pediatrician gastroenterologist can actually treat it. And what do the kids describe? Do you have any um, any description? Yeah, Same thing. It could be cough. It could be yeah. cough. It could be the, the asthma. It could be the asthma. Uh-huh. And yeah, it could be wheezing. It could be uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, sore throats. And some children can actually feel heartburn. Like I remember when I was a kid, I used to feel heartburn just like my grandmother I used to do. I don't know if I got it from her or something, but the same description. And I started having it also. Is there a hereditary component to heartburn, um, to the whole hasn't... phenomena? Um, there's always a hereditary component to everything, to be okay. honest with you. But in this particular case, we haven't we haven't really linked any genes or any pathways that have been truly identified. But we, we everything has some sort of a genetic background for sure. Right, even varicose veins. Right, if my mother had, yeah, it, I'll probably have. Yeah, I get yeah, it. it's basically the, it, you have a, a genetic predisposition to things, you know, and um, it, it, it it's always a strong component on there and in everything that we have. Now, is stratotherapy, that would be something, so if medicine didn't work, we could go to stratotherapy, we could change our lifestyle a little bit, right, and um, look at things that cause it or make it worse, and we really have to have really good communication with our primary care and, and talk about things honestly and take suggestions openly, but is there something that you would want to leave the listening audience with, any, like, any kind of wise words yeah. about this? Kind of Absolutely. very very common common problem. Absolutely, the, the the other the other option that people have to medications, you know, are surgery and strata. Mm-hmm. Strata is a very good one because it's not it's not surgery, and you could always have surgery if it doesn't work. Um, but the main thing that's happening in the last three to five three I think three to five years is that the data has been being revealed on the side effects of the common medications that we use for reflux. And these are the proton pump inhibitors that have been linked to uh, decreasing bone density, which can lead to fractures. They have been linked to uh, renal failure, vitamin deficiencies. Um, um, and uh, in, there's some cases of some reports in which there's no real correlation identified yet, but there's, there's been a statistical uh, uh, findings of, of, of an association between uh, proton pump inhibitors, things like omeprazole, Nexium, mm-hmm. tonics, with uh, dementia, and that's been out there. You, everybody saw that article in the Times uh, a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, actually last year. But these side effects of long-term therapy are the ones that are that are people should worry about because they're they're really there, and um, we want to avoid using those medications as much as possible. If we can't avoid them because we have to do it, then we have to look for other options. At the end of the day, if you're having symptoms of uh, heartburn and reflux, the best thing to do is not to defer uh, and procrastinate. It's just, the, the sooner you go to your doctor, the better, because you can have an actual uh, designed uh, strategy for, for the future, because it's, it's a condition that sometimes stays with us. It doesn't go away. You know, that's really, that's probably the best the best advice to give everybody here. And we want to thank our guest, Dr. Lincoln Hernandez, for being with us today. And we want to thank you, our listening audience. This brings an end to another edition of Your Family's Health on 90.3 FM, the voice of Nassau Community College. Joan Buckley is professor of nursing at Nassau Community College. Your comments are always welcome at whpc at ncc.edu. This program was produced at the studios of WHPC 90.3 on the campus of Nassau Community College. Join us again next week for another edition of Your Family's Health.